So violence is one of those real negative things and it's not just me saying these guys are just dangerous, violent individuals. It's about questioning why. Why would they in prison go on to commit such horrendous crimes? What drives these very young men to commit these acts of violence? On this episode of Second Chance Podcast, I'm interviewed by my former head of fundraising at the Raphael Rowe Foundation, a foundation that I set up off of the back of inside the world's toughest prisons. Rightly or wrongly, you committed murder, you will go to prison until you die. There's no hope, there's no aspiration, there is nothing to look forward to. You know, that is tough and hence why I say inside the world's toughest prisons is not just about the toughness through fear of violence. Every, everybody wants to say, hey, I've done a good thing today, but actually I think we've got an opportunity here with the foundation to really enhance the value that we can bring to people's lives and, and make that positive change. When we got to the bottom of the last barrel, if you like, of the rice and I scooped it and put it in wise, there was at least another 30, 40 guys lined up. And I'm like turning to the guy and saying, where's the next pot? And he said, there's nothing left. And I looked and I said, but these guys here, they haven't been fed. And he said, they won't get fed. And I felt so guilty and so responsible that in my effort to be sympathetic and in my effort to try and feed these guys sensibly, I made a big mistake. Welcome to the Second Chance Podcast. I'm your host, Raphael Rowe. On this podcast, we talk to people from diverse backgrounds who share their stories of redemption, resilience and second chance. Go to our YouTube channel so you can watch those interviews, subscribe, share and click on the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. Jamie, thanks for coming in um, on this sort of pretend moment, actually, because we're in Amsterdam. We're here together on a business trip to meet with potential fundraisers for the foundation that we're going to talk about in this episode. Um, so for those listening, be aware that we are in Amsterdam. We're kind of ad-libbing this, but I wanted to, to coincide the new series of the podcast with the release of Inside the World's Toughest Prisons, which drops on Netflix this week. So Jamie, you um, volunteered actually to get involved in the fundraising, but we're going to turn the table slightly here and I'm going to let you ask me a few questions. So fire away. What is it that you want to know that you think the listeners want to know gearing towards why we are doing such important work off of the back of the Netflix show? All right. Hey, thanks, Raf. And uh, it's good to be with you in Amsterdam. Look, firstly, Congratulations on the new series, Inside the World's Toughest Prisons. I have got a few questions about the series, and I'm sure our listeners will be thinking too. Um, and of course, I'm excited to talk to you about the Raphael Rowe Foundation. So let, let's start with the, this upcoming series. You know, first of all, the name, okay? Inside the World's Toughest Prisons. What is it about these places that makes them tough? Let's start there. Well, for me, it's not just about drugs and violence that you often find in you know maximum security prisons or that you associate with prisons and what goes on in prisons it's also about the the psychological toughness of being in prison you know what that takes out of an individual who is sent to prison and many people who are sent to prison are sent to prison for the very first time there are lots of recidivists lots of people who commit you know, crimes after they've been to prison and come out of prison. But for me, inside the world's toughest prisons doesn't just mean the threat of violence or the brutality that are often experienced in prison, but it's also about the emotional and psychological challenges that individuals have to face being confined in a, in a prison space. And during this particular season, um, you know, I've met individuals who were destined for the crimes that they've committed to spend the rest of their life, their natural life in prison, you know, try and get your head around that. Somebody says to you, you know, rightly or wrongly, you committed murder, you will go to prison until you die. There's no hope, there's no aspiration, there is nothing to look forward to, you know, that is tough. Now you can put that individual, in my view, in the most humane, modernized, progressive prison, but still to get your head around the psychological threat of never seeing daylight again 
is for me tough. And hence why I say inside the world's toughest prisons is not just about the toughness through fear of violence. It's fascinating. And I think that in itself is something that certainly I cannot relate to. And I'm sure many people listening cannot even comprehend the idea of not only having their lives taken away, but also then the possibility of being treated in an, unhuman, in an inhumane way. And I, I imagine, you know, the prison systems that you visit and these facilities around the world, they vary on how they approach those and, and how, they, how they treat people, which I know is, it we'll get into when we're talking about the, the kind of the, the mission and the purpose behind you setting up the foundation. But in, Syria, in this next series, could you tell, where are you going? What kind of things do you think we can expect? And with that, something that I'm really fascinated to know about, logistically, how do you end up going to these places? From research to touching down in a country, what's that journey then look like to you being inside the prison? Let me start by asking, answering that one first. I mean, it takes a hell of a long time to persuade a government to give us access to show their dirty laundry, if you like, you know, I mean, asking a government to let you inside a prison, especially in a country where they don't have the resources to provide the basic needs of, you know, prisons for prisoners. And I'm talking about sanitation, I'm talking about hot running water or just running water in itself. The ability to provide activities, meaningful activities, which allows for prisoners to be rehabilitated. And rehabilitation can mean lots of different things in lots of different countries. And I found that on this journey. So the logistics of trying to convince a government that they should give us access to their prison can be quite challenging. I mean, you know, the other side of that is some governments are quite open to the idea. They want to show their communities, they want to show their country that they're doing the best that they can to rehabilitate people in prison with limited resources. And so they are more open to the idea of giving us access. But it can take you know, six, even 12 months at times, sometimes, once you make the initial approach to the government or to the prison establishment and ask for access. Um, luckily for us, as the seasons have gone on, more countries are, you know, it's a phenomenal success, the program itself around the world. So that does open doors. At least it gives the authorities an insight into what it is that we're doing and how we do it. So they don't have to think we're doing it for the first time. They can have a look at what we've done previously. And if they buy into the idea that we're not going in there to just sensationalize the bad side of the prisons, but also the challenges they face. And that's really important because the challenges they face is something that they're prepared to sort of share with the audience. So, so it helps that we have previous episodes, seasons going out that they can look at. But even then, sometimes it can be quite challenging because the, the minute detail in each country is very different. You know, whether it's a financial, whether it's, you know, the conditions themselves or, or the regimes that they run. So it can take logistically a very long time. But once we get almost the agreement and the contracts are signed, then the, the team that I work with, and I work with a team just to give you a picture of, of how many people are involved. So there's me, obviously the host of the program, the important one. And then you have the two people who work very closely alongside me, who sort of hold the cameras inside the prisons with me. So they will generally be people um, you know, self-directors who have a lot of experience working in foreign countries, in hostile environments, challenging environments, not always in prisons. You know, I've worked with various directors who have not ever been inside a prison, so it's their first time. So not only have they got to juggle the logistics of making sure that we get what we want in the duration of the time that we're in there, but they also have to operate a camera. And it's not as easy as just pressing record, pointing the camera. You know, you have to stylize it the sound. We have a sound man or woman who we bring in from either the country that we're traveling from, England, or we hire somebody locally. So the team will comprise of myself, two camera people, two cameras all the time pointing at me and the individuals that we're interviewing, somebody who records the sound so we get good quality of sound and we have mics put on us um, at certain points during the shoot. And then if obviously I'm in a country where they don't speak English and I don't speak any other languages and people ask that kind of question all the time, like how do you converse with these individuals if they're speaking Ukrainian or, or Russian or Spanish and you don't speak Spanish? Well, I have a translator 
And that translator will you know, translate my questions. I'll answer the question, they then repeat the question, the prisoner will answer in their mother tongue, or sometimes they try and speak in English, which makes it a lot easier. Um, and that's generally the team. Um, we might have a fixer, and by fixer it's somebody who helps with the logistics of you know, talking to the authorities ahead of us going in. But that person often doubles up as my translator, so when they're translating for me, they're not fixing. But they generally do all the stuff on the ground ahead of me and the team turning up. So that is what comprises of, of our team. And then throughout the duration of the shoot, you know, the seven days where we're in the prison, we stick very closely together. In terms of security, well, we don't have any security. We rely heavily on two things. One is the chaperone who will be a member of staff. So there is somebody who is assigned to us for the duration of the time that we're there who will unlock gates, you know, because I don't have keys and the team don't have keys. And so we are dependent on that um, prison officer opening and closing gates and allowing us in and out of the um, space that we are filming in. But beyond that, that is the team. That is the logistical side. That's how we, we shoot our stuff. And, you know, we gather hours and hours and hours of content. You know, in the end, it's edited down to one hour. And I wouldn't say that the audience are cheated by that. I don't think that even though we shoot hours and hours of footage, the one hour that makes it onto the Netflix platform is a condense of the three hours that I would have sat down and spoken to a prisoner, maybe two hours on camera, an hour off camera, where we're just having a coffee and a chat and I'm relaxing that individual or getting to know that individual because key to the success is the trust. And that's the second thing. So the guard opening gates, but the second thing, which is probably the most important thing, logistically is the trust that I build with the prisoners so that they are protecting us, if you like. If they are sending the word out that we're good guys, it means that those that are a little bit more antagon antagonistic towards us, who don't really want us to be there, they don't like the idea of cameras filming inside the prison, um, they don't take part in the show and we're very you know, shrewd to that fact that if they don't want to participate, we won't point the camera in their direction. And we do go for a very, very vigorous, rigorous um, consent process. Nobody who appears in the program appears because we want them to. It's because they are prepared to share their story. They are prepared to sign the contract that says they are happy for us to share their personal, very deep story of who they are, maybe the trauma they've been through, but also the crimes that they've committed. And anybody who is familiar with this show that's listening, including yourself, will know that some people share some harrowing stories about about the things that they've done. I hope that explains a little bit about the process. No, it does. Thanks, Raf. And I guess it quite nicely leads on to my next question for you because it's it's obvious that you're, 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 treat, you're, you're talking to people who in many instances, are the most downtrodden people in society because of how they are being treated. And I think Inside the World's Toughest Prisons actually shows in a lot of these facilities that people are not being treated like people in many instances. That must be really tough when you are building rapport, gaining that trust to come in with a camera crew and get into quite a personal space. But then from your side, that must be quite tough as well. How do you compartmentalize being a journalist where you've got to get some facts, but also being a human being that can relate to being in a prison and talking to people who, rightly or wrongly, are, have been convicted of some, some pretty bad things? That must be quite tough psychologically for you as a journalist. I think the first thing to say, and it's the easiest thing to say is I've been there, Jamie, you know, I've sat in that prison cell and I've been judged in the same way that these individuals are being judged either by the criminal justice system, by society, by journalists who go in and interview these people who have a particular agenda. So I was one of those people. I was one of those people, though I was innocent, I was still a convicted murderer in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of people that were looking on me. I knew that I wasn't that person. So I know what it feels like to be wrongly judged. Now, I just extend that to convicted people, people who are guilty of their crime. Now, instead of them judging, instead of me judging them on the crime that they've committed, I judge them on the person I meet. 
long before I discover in most instances, there are a couple of occasions where I have to know what they've done. The authorities may insist that I know what they've done before I go into that cell because they could pose a real threat to me because they could be psychologically or psychiatrically um, challenging and they have mental health issues. So I don't judge individuals for what they've done. I discover who they are first and foremost. And then if I discover that they've done something horrendous, which in most cases they have, then my, I suppose, judgment of that person does change naturally as it does the viewer when they discover, like in the Moldova episode in season six, you know, I meet and have some fun with my two cellmates and we're singing and we're having fun. And then I speak to one of them and he tells me he's in for a double murder. He killed an old woman and a young woman in a very brutal way. And my whole persona towards him changed. And that's natural. He felt that. I felt that. And I didn't hide that fact. I told him that that knowing what he's done now, I see him differently and I can't help but see him differently. You know, before I was looking him in the eyes and I was thinking, you're a man who spent 17 years in prison. That's why you have such dark eyes. But all of a sudden, I know he's committed a double murder in such an horrendous way that maybe that's why his eyes are so dark, because he has the image of what he'd done in his mind all the time. So that's pretty evident. In terms of compartmentizing, well, I have a technique. And it's something that I used during my own time in prison when I was suffering. And it's often one of the things is I would, during a really tough day, I'd have a shower. And when I had a shower, the water from the shower would, you know, the droplets of water would hit my body. And every time the water hit my body, I was trying to wash away those days' thoughts, those negativities. I tried to use that as a way to cope with being wrongly imprisoned. And I use that as part of the professionalism that when I come out of these prisons, having been there for seven days, I try and wash away all of the stories, the harrowing stories or the details, even where I have empathy and sympathy because I cannot take that home with me. I cannot take it back into my everyday life or it would haunt me. Now, that's not to say that, you know, back in England, when I'm back in my family home and I'm, you know, kind of normalizing my life again, I don't have memories or moments where I remember some of the stories. But again, that's what drove me to set up the foundation um, based on, you know, the lack of opportunity for, for prisoners. And so my kind of compartmentizing is I'm a professional and I, I, I try and have been doing it for such a long time. I try not to bring what I'm hearing in that environment into my everyday life. It's challenging and it's difficult, but I've been pretty good at, at doing it, I think. If you can think over the last few years, Raphael, are there some key memorable events either on camera or off camera, that will stay with you, that you really think, wow, that has had a big impact on me, either positive or negative, some real impactful things? I think it varies. I think in the early days when I was doing this series, um, I, I, I traveled more extensively to South America in particular, and the extreme violence that I became aware of that took place inside the prison, either just before I got there, whilst I was there in Paraguay, there was a murder while I was in the prison. We were attacked by prisoners, but I built up a really good relationship with the prisoners. Since I made that episode, I've seen um, footage of a riot that took place in that prison of people being murdered. Um, and I mean brutally murdered, um, decapitated, and um, horrible scenes. So violence is one of those real negative things, and it's not just me saying these guys are just dangerous, violent individuals. It's about questioning why. Why would they, in prison, go on to commit such horrendous crimes? What drives these very young men to commit these acts of violence? So that's one side. In other places, the conditions have been so, so appalling that I cannot believe that human beings are being held in those conditions. And I, I understand that when I take my Western ways, you know, I come from London, I live in London, we have our own challenges to fit how our lifestyles. And then you go to some of these places and they don't have running water. 
they they wash in buckets of dirty water they cook you know by lighting a fire they don't have the amenities to provide proper cooking facilities or prisoners are underfed they don't get the nutrients that the governments and the prisons should be feeding these so there is a wide range of things both positive and negative that I've experienced during the making of this series that has really shocked me equally you 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 know seeing prisoners excel at the opportunities the minimal opportunities you know a prisoner never reading before being given a book for the first time and then learning to read by reading that book or attempting to read that book either in their language or in another language over and over again over a period of years and they're very proud of their own achievement and that was about self-discipline self you know wanting to progress so there are lots of positives you know and Sometimes it's just sitting down with guys who have been in prison for a very long time, but they have a, a positive outlook and all they ask for is support. And you think, well, you're in prison and people will think you're in prison and that's what you're there for, to be punished. Well, being sent to prison is the punishment. Being punished whilst they're in prison by lack of opportunity, lack of activities is, is a in some places, the lack of resources and something can be done about that, either locally or globally, something can be done about that. So as I say, it varies really the conditions that I've seen um, and the experiences I've had. And I always talk about one particular incident, Jamie, that that really struck a chord with me. And, and it is one of those basic needs of being fed. You, you, you know, poverty exists all around the world and people struggle on the outside as they do on the inside. And it was during the making of the Papua New Guinea episode where, you know, I was having a lot of fun with these guys in the kitchen cooking rice. Now, that's all they get. Their staple diet is rice one at one point in the day and a tin of sardines. And then they get the same diet at a second point during the day. And when we were making this this rice pot on this kind of, you know, prehistoric kind of stove you know it was all very 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 basic um you know we had to stick wood under light the wood i mean on the one hand it's quite romantic but it is prehistoric you know in this day and age where it is simple it was prehistoric but we cooked this rice for these inmates and people who have seen this episode will know where i'm going with this but those who haven't when i finished cooking the rice the you know, prisoners lined up at the kiosk to pick up their, their rice. And I was scooping up rice and putting it in their bowls or, you know, cut containers, whatever it is that they were using to gather this rice. And I was giving them probably a little bit more than I should have been giving them because the guy that was working with me kept saying to me, you're giving them a little bit too much rice. And I thought, well, come on, we've got pots of rice here, we'll be all right. But actually, when we got to the bottom of the last barrel, if you like, of the rice, and I scooped it and put it in wise, there was at least another 30, 40 guys lined up. And I'm like turning to the guy and saying, where's the next pot? And he said, there's nothing left. And I looked and I said, but these guys here, they haven't been fed. And he said, they won't get fed. And I felt so guilty and so responsible that in my effort to be sympathetic and in my effort to try and feed these guys sensibly, I made a big mistake. I deprived so many prisoners of food and it, it, it lived with me. I just couldn't shake the fact that these guys, instead of kicking off, you know, instead of rioting and saying we're not being fed, they kind of accepted their fate. They'd been conditioned to just accept the fact that they were not going to be fed. And the guy said to me, well, they won't get fed now until later on in the day when we have the second portion. And these guys just turned away and they hadn't been fed that day. And that can't be right. You know, that cannot be right. Um, and it just felt so uncomfortable for me. I know, I know the scene in the episode that you're talking about, Raf. And I, I thought, and still now, I often wonder, off camera, does it really kick off? But what you've just said there, the fact that they've been conditioned, and it's almost like that's the way it is. I think this leads on to nicely for us to talk about the foundation and the reasons why. So let me ask you this question. What, what is the Raphael Rowe Foundation? Why have you set it up? I think using that example of not being able to get the basic needs, food, you, 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 you know, something that if the authorities themselves don't have the resources financially to support the, the, the feeding of prisoners, then surely local businesses who have access, excess amounts could contribute. They could do something, even if it's financial or it's by giving practical bags of rice. 
that could have made a huge difference, but they don't. There is a disconnect and people just don't want to engage. So that's what drove me. I kept, if, if I'm honest, I kept walking out of some of these prisons, seeing the, the, the conditions, the lack of basic needs, the inability of the authorities to understand what rehabilitation is the, you know, not just the prisoners, but also the staff who don't have proper uniforms or they don't have themselves food because the prisons don't provide it. They have to, you know, bring in a packed lunch and they can't afford to pay for the packed lunch, you know. So all of these things culminated in me sitting there one day and thinking, I've got to do more. It's one thing making a program where you're entertaining people and people are given an insight into the balance between security and rehabilitation or conditions in prison. But it's another thing trying to do something more. And so having been into many of these prisons and walked out and not thought about it, and it wasn't something I thought about even when I myself was a prisoner that you can do something. I mean, I'd always been bothered by the lack of facilities or the lack of opportunity for people to educate themselves. And so coming out of these prisons, I thought, I've got to do something. What can I do? Right, I'm going to try and set up a charity where I can maybe convince the local Papua New Guinea manufacturer of rice or importer of rice to donate some of that rice to that prison, something simple like that. And it kind of snowballed into this mission where I want to provide better facilities for prisoners, families, victims and staff to have a better chance at reducing the risk of prisoners leaving prison, either with mental health issues being deprived of any kind of sensory that turns them into the animal that they may become when they leave prison to go on to commit further crimes. But just to change the basic needs, improve the conditions, you know, provide opportunities and activities to ensure that the basic human rights are being met in some of these prisons. And it starts with the mantra of the foundation. So the mission and the value starts with the rethink. So we have this strap line, as you know, called rethinking. It's about changing the authorities' perspective, changing the public's perspective about what prison is about, what the purpose of prison is. It's about making people think differently, that it's not just about locking people up. And that leads to rehumanizing, you know, kind of making these people feel like human beings rather than the the brutal, dangerous criminals or thieves that they are often deemed to be when they're sent to prison by people who don't understand them, they don't understand the world that, or the economical environment, the social environment that they've been brought up in. And then obviously, during all of that time of you know, changing people's perceptions, rehumanizing, and giving people the basic human rights, those individuals will be released. So it's about reintegrate. So we think rehumanizing and reintegrating these individuals who will be released back into society, making that transition a, 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 a meaningful one, whether it's job opportunity or the aspirations to do more than just go back to the life that they led before that led to them being turned to prison. So the mission really is, and the reason for setting up the foundation, one of the key reasons is to, to change the purpose of prison and make it more meaningful so people don't come out of prison and commit further crimes. And that is all about preventing the next victim. You mentioned in the, in the story of Papua New Guinea, a disconnect. And the Rafael Rowe Foundation really is to help bridge that disconnect and make the connection, right? Because I guess with Inside the World Stuff is Prisons, a big global reach, many fans of the of the of the documentary series. I mean, you've got a, a big social media following yourself, which is great. So you're really well positioned to to push this initiative. Let's call it the rethink, reintegrate, rehumanize, so that we can be a bit proactive, be proactive, raise the awareness, and actually do something for positive change. There's there's a direct link, isn't there, between reoffender rates and what people have been exposed to while imprisoned, and so I guess that is another reason why the foundation exists. But how do we operationalize this? It all sounds great. I don't. Uh, and let's let's maybe talk about who's involved today and what the what the vision is, okay? because the vision, as a, as it says on the website, is to end dehumanization of people in prison and build safer societies. 
you've you've touched on a few things that were it's not just the inmates it's the guards the staff it's also the families of the inmates the families of the guards and then the surrounding communities so actually the purpose and the vision for the foundation touches many many people and you've mentioned the key thing whenever i talk to anybody a potential funder it's about basic human rights and i think that's the key right many things that were fortunate to be exposed to in this part of the world you know like you I'm, i live in the uk we get those basic human rights as a given maybe we take those for granted water food basic sanitation a bed so how do we then translate the vision and operationalize into some of these really tough countries and really quite impoverished places how do we actually make that change i think the first thing I would say is when I look at the audience's reaction to the show itself, you know, this is a show inside the world's toughest prisons is a show about prisons. It's about, you, you know, as you said earlier, the, 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 the most disadvantaged and most vulnerable people in our society. And these individuals do have families. You know, no one was born a criminal. You know, these individuals went through a a particular lifestyle, let's say, that led them to do the things that they did that ended up in prison. I'm not saying that's an excuse or a reason because lots of people don't do that. Lots of people in that same environment go on to lead, you know, normal lives without crime and criminality. But first, it's the audience's reaction. The viewer's response to the show has really inspired me in the same way the show inspires them. And by that, I mean, I get hundreds and thousands of messages from people sort of saying, I really didn't know that's what life was like in prison. And they're not just saying it from the perspective of, oh my God, isn't it really violent? Oh my God, people use drugs in prison. Because everybody knows that. Everybody knows that these things take place in prison. To what extent? Well, that depends on where you get your news from and what information you read about prisons and, and how people and what their take is on prison. So first it's about the viewer's response that made me realize that people do care. People do care that these individuals in prisons, you could do more to help them and they want to do more. And they ask, what more can I do? And do I meet up with these people? And was this individual successful in turning their life around? Because that was one of the conversations we had in, in prisons. So that made me think, well, maybe you could help me help them not just the prisoners, but the staff as well, or the conditions. And how do we do that together? One of the ways of doing that is by getting local businesses, I think one of the ways of doing it is getting local businesses to want to help, to want to invest in the rehumanization of individuals by, um, I'll keep using the rice example, by making a simple donation. You're not asking them to... Um, believe that a person in prison is a good person or believe that somebody who's committed a crime shouldn't be getting access to basics. It's just saying to them, give us something that we can give to somebody else to change their life, the profound impact that they can, that that could have on them. And people can often turn around and say, well, I'd rather give that rice to a poor community outside. Well, do that as well. That would be my argument. You know, I'm not asking you to choose between the two. If you can do for both, then do for both. If you can't do it for both and want to choose the person who's living in poverty somewhere else in the world, then do that. And I support that as well. I'm not saying just us and nobody else. But if you have the capacity to do it for somebody that's in prison or for the prison environment, then you should do that as well. And that, you know, that is simple support. Give it. We take it. We give it. I don't think it has to be as complex or as complicated as some organizations who work in prison make it out to be. You know, of course, there are logistical issues and there are concerns obviously taking anything to a prison there are security measures but those are things that can over, be overcome quite quickly in order to to do these things you need financial support you need backing you need people you need personnel you have to have people who believe that you can bring about change you don't just want people involved because they want to be involved for involved state they've got to have a passion to believe that these are not just prisoners. This is not just a prison, but these are human beings. And giving people their human rights 
is, is a necessity. It's something that we are all entitled to and we should all be able to, to access whether you are in prison and you're not in, or you're not in prison. You know, education being another thing, if somebody in prison has never been given the opportunity to better themselves through education, then a manufacturer of books could quite easily denote donate their excess books to go into prisons. These could be textbooks that help people educate themselves in English, maths, or other um, vocabulary or, or, or other kind of training, whether it's skill-based, you know, a workshop. Why can't somebody who runs a workshop, a wood workshop outside of prison, a successful business, create an environment within a prison to train prisoners to become um, you know, experts at woodwork or metalwork or some other skill, a mechanic. It's, it's simple stuff that I think operationally people can invite into prisons. And I think it would be welcomed in many places. I'm always baffled by the fact that it's not already taking place. So I go into some of these prisons and I say, what NGOs do you have come into the prison to help with the, I don't know, the, the medical um support of prisoners who are suffering from illnesses and they say we don't have any what ngos do you have in the country we don't have any and it makes me scratch my head and think well that's something we can do that is something that we can create and i'm not saying that we do it and we maintain it it's something that can be sustainable that can be taken over by locals who are interested and as i say based on the viewers response there are lots of people in these countries around the world who would volunteer their time or their expertise to do that. They just need to be shown the way. So for me, it's about showing people the way to do it for it to be a success. Great. And you mentioned another word I've picked up on, education. There could be education opportunities here for inmates, but I think we've got a bigger piece of education to think about in terms of helping educate local societies, local businesses about actually how their involvement could be for the greater good, right? Every, everybody wants to say, hey, I've done a good thing today, but Actually, I think we've got an opportunity here with the foundation to really enhance the value that we can bring to people's lives and, and make that positive change. So, so with that, we mentioned funding. You mentioned small businesses. If, I, if we were to kind of explain what does an ideal funder look like, I'm going to take a stab. If I'm asking you the question, I'm going to stay, take a stab at this first, Rafa, if I may. There is no typical profile we're looking for here. We want somebody to care. And this is about basic human rights. I'd like to think the majority of people care about people's human rights. Just so happens that most of these applications we're talking about are centered in and around prison populations. But if somebody wants it, somebody listening now thinks, wow, there's something in this. I want to get involved. What does that involve? What could that involvement look like? How do they get involved? And what does that look like over the next five years for the foundation? What are some of the things that we're trying to do? I think it comes in, in, in different ways, actually, because somebody with expertise in something, it could be a psychologist, let's say, for example. So a psychologist is listening to this podcast right now, and they know a way to get into the minds of individuals whose minds have never gotten into before to make them think about the traumatic past in order to better their future. So they don't think in a violent way. And we all know it's been done in many different ways. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but a psychologist. So the expertise, it could be that somebody runs a business in the community, but they don't have the workforce. They need skills. So they take their expertise into prison and they train prisoners in recruitment, in the skills that I talked about earlier on, you know, woodwork or whatever, and they provide an opportunity for those individuals when they come out of prison. So there is that, that expertise, people who have the expertise to offer that service. So we're not asking for financial support, we're asking for practical support to help these individuals turn their lives around or provide opportunities within these establishments so that those individuals have aspirations or hope or, or can look forward to something. And then there are individuals I want to think about the fact that had something like this happened to them or a member of their family, you know, criminality sometimes doesn't just deprive from um, or arise from deprived neighborhoods. Somebody driving a car down the road accidentally smashes into another car, the people in the other car lose their lives and they can be done for reckless driving. This is a law-abiding citizen who ends up in prison, and it could be them. And how would you want to be treated, is what I would ask. How would you want to 
live alongside another man or woman who has tendencies to act violently? Wouldn't you want that person not to be violent so they're not a threat to you? Well, then, you know, provide the means to help that person understand that there are other ways of dealing with their anger or other ways of dealing with a situation that in their mind, the only way to react is violently. Um, and that can be education, that can be therapy, that can mean lots of different things. So people can get involved from that perspective. And then obviously the, the no brainer is the small donations that we get from people who give a dollar or five pounds or you know 10 euros. They're small, meaningful ways of sort of saying, I hope this goes some way to help you do what you're trying to do. And then there are the big donors, you know, the corporations who I think have a responsibility to give something back from the work that they do. I don't know this world, and that's the beauty of what I enjoy. I don't know this world, so I can discover as I go along, well, what is it that you want to achieve? You're a successful business, you know, you employ lots of people, you're having an impact in the world of work that you work in, but what do you want to do somewhere else? What can you do somewhere else? Who can you help? What do you want to help? And as I say, it can mean a completely different space. But people should care about these because it's not, you know, you think about the UK, we have a population of 70,000 people in prison in a population of 70 million. Why can't we address that problem? Why can't we deal with, you, you know, the amount of people that end up going to prison and maybe even divert them from going in prison by giving them another opportunity, an opportunity maybe they've never had. And I just want people to help either with their expertise or provide some kind of financial support. You know, we as a foundation need people to help us run the organization and we have lots of volunteers. It would be great to be able to pay people to do the work that they do, even though they care about it and want to do it, you know, voluntarily, you know, their commitment is what's important. And sometimes, you know, being able to fund the work whether it's research, whether it's the practical work of going from one place to another place to implement some of the ideas that we have to change people's lives, that requires money. And so fundraising for us is really important. Great. And, uh, and right now, we're a relatively small but lean team. I mean, your name is above the door and you are actively involved. But there's a, there's a handful of us here. And, and I think with that, it, the beauty is that any donation, any fundraising we get, we have line of sight to every pound and penny that gets spent. And we are really, we scrutinize where, our, where where the money goes because it is so important. And we don't pay, you know, we don't have middlemen taking a cut. And so I guess my message here uh, as your head of fundraising is that, as you say, Raphael, we're not after one type of profile. We're after the, we just want people to care and to really believe in it and, and we're learning as we go. And I think it's safe to say that we're, we have that humility to say, OK, we need to pivot what we're doing as we learn. And so any expertise that we can get in is great. Of course, financial donations are, are really going to help us into, to build and scale. Right now, the foundation is just over a year old. We are close to becoming a registered charity. That's going to open more doors as well. In, in the UK, we're registered as a CIC, but soon, maybe even by the time this podcast goes out, we'll be a, a CIO, a, a charity, which is which is great. And so I've, I've got to do a little plug here on rafaelrofoundation.org. There is a section where you can read about, about us and, and some of the things we're involved in, but also there's a donate and there's a, there's a GoFundMe. And every pound or dollar that we get is well received and we're really careful how that gets spent, right? So I had to just get that little plug in there, Raf. But I've got um, I've got a, I've got another question. I'm conscious of time, but it just to put you on the spot here, you're probably and our viewers, our listeners will be familiar with Aladdin, and there's the genie with the magic lamp. I want to hypothetically, you know, imagine I'm giving you that lamp, and you get three wishes. Okay, what's going to make you look back? Let's say in five years' time from now, with these three wishes, to think that was incredible we have really made an impact because of these three things that have happened. I think the first thing is improving the conditions in prisons around the globe. And I think that is achievable. And I think with people's support, practical support, their expertise and their funding, 
that that is is possible and i think not only is that a success for us as a foundation it's a success for the prisons who have opened their doors and are willing to invite um, improvement i think you know there is some resistance in some places because the tried and tested is what they believe in but i believe that that would be a, an open door and it's also a success i think for those that have you know supported the foundation financially or with their expertise or you know offering activity or opportunity for prison so for me that's about the success the, the 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 one thing for me is you know you can sit and articulate all day long the right words that come out of charities and make the right noises about reform rehabilitation um and you can articulate it in a way where people believe that that's what they want to get involved in that's what they will you know support financially or offer their expertise i want the foundation and i believe that it's part of the people that are involved in the foundation including yourself and our other volunteers i want people to feel and believe the authenticity of it that it's not just about the words it's not just about the narrative it's about the practicalities and i'll give you an example when i recently visited a prison i met lots of prisoners who were really interested in the creative arts but they just didn't have the materials they don't have the materials to embark on what is going to change their lives creatives painters artists they don't have the pens or the paints or the canvases or even the paper to do art and you scratch your head again and think well why a small donation of 5000 pound could buy a huge amount of materials it goes into our funding and then it gets spent on that materials delivered to those prisoners who can put it to good use and then you evaluate what difference did it make and you could take it a step further and you could use that that opportunity to do some kind of art therapy where you then address some underlying problems that led those individuals to go to prison so for me in the next 3 to 5 years that's success but it shouldn't have to take that long jamie you know if someone made a small donation now to the foundation we can implement that with the will of the people involved in the foundation with the will of the prison and the authorities who would welcome the opportunity to make that donation um you can change people's lives you can improve the and prevent those individuals going out and committing further crimes i'm not saying by them sitting there and drawing a picture but by learning that skill believing in something they've never been able to believe in which is themselves it can have a profound impact and i say that because i've been there you know i've been that person sitting in a cell who enjoyed doing art as a way of escaping the mundane of prison but i didn't have the materials to paint had i had those materials i wouldn't have walked out that cell a miserable grumpy individual i would have bounced out of that cell thinking i just achieved a really good you know i don't know self portrait or something like that so for me success is really about the short term as well as the long term you know the sustainable things that we could do Again when we talk about the rice and I have to go back to the rice you think that these guys could grow their own vegetables they have the land but nothing's happening it's just so dead ground it's dead grass well you know let's go in there plant a few potatoes plant plant a few tomatoes and they've got more than they had before and you're also teaching them a skill something that they're doing for themselves and that can make them feel proud and sometimes that's what it can be about so for me it's about the short term success as well as the long term success Great. Thank you, Raf. And and I and I going back to that rice story. It I think that's one of the key things, right? It's about the sustainability of it. It's not actually going in and saying, "Here's a bag of rice. We feel good. See you later." It's actually the long term. And what you've just said there by us being able to help implant that, get the funding and the resources to set that up so that it's sustainable, that's just going to have a snowball effect on the on the the conditions, the livelihood of those inmates. And then that's when we can scale. that's when we can replicate and copy and paste that approach into other facilities around the world. All right, amazing. Absolutely. Well, look, I mean, before we go, and I know this is a different episode to what I would normally do on the Second Chance podcast, but it's all around the same theme. It's all about, you know, giving people a second chance, inviting people to change their lives, inviting people to get involved in helping people change their lives from the privilege of their own life. 
Um, but it also enhances who they are because they feel good, as you said, about doing something. As the head of fundraising, when you approach people and you're talking to people about supporting the foundation, supporting a mission to improve the conditions and the lives of people who are caught up in the criminal justice system that end up in prison. What, what, what do you want people to know, Jamie, about what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do what you're trying to do? We've covered a, a couple of things, but I'll, I'll, I'll put down to a couple of key points, Ra. This is about doing the right thing. This is about impacting people. These are people we're talking about, improving people's lives. They are people before they are being convicted of what they're being convicted of. And it's about giving them their basic human rights, which certainly in the country that you and I live in, we take this for granted. How do I then? So I'm talking to some corporations who have philanthropic budgets or they have an ESG, you know, corporate societal goals to meet and they want to they want to they want to do the right thing so it's about educating them on how what we're doing aligns with their values and often you know human rights are high up there if you look at the united nations sustainable development goals one of the goals is about basic human rights so it's about how do we really translate how what we're doing can be in line with a company's core values then when we're talking to maybe individuals who want to do funding on a project specific. You know, we are we are new, we are young in our existence, but we're very passionate. I mean, obviously with you, Raphael, your passion for this is incredible, but the team that we've got, we will all want to do the right thing. And so working with like-minded people, individuals, companies, charitable organizations, small businesses that want to be part of this journey, to be part of that success that you've nicely articulated that's what it's about for us and again it's about that basic maslow's hierarchy of needs on the bottom of that pyramid it's about food water sanitation bed warmth and security where we can really make a massive difference for people around the world on those basic needs and i think we're really well set up this is a really exciting time for us to do it your your online presence you know, you've got a great global reach. You, the success of the Second Chance podcast, Inside the World's Toughest Prisons. I think now we can elevate this to really be able to make positive impact. So the way that I speak to people who want to get involved is to talk to them, to, t to tell them more about what we're doing and how it aligns with how they want to help. And you know, the other thing is, uh, I, I often reflect, and you mentioned it there, you know, basic human rights. And I know we've banged on about that during the conversation. And I, I, I always reflect and think, well, why would you want to help? It's a prisoner. And the last thing you want to do is support somebody that's committed a crime and ended up in prison. But you mustn't see it like that. You mustn't see like you're supporting somebody who's committed a crime and has ended up in prison. It's what you've just said. It's about people. It's about supporting somebody in their moment of need where you can give them an opportunity to change their life because of the mistake that they made. And the majority, and this is important, the majority of people who end up in prison have made a mistake. We talk about murderers, we talk about rapists, sex offenders, we talk about violent offenders, we talk about thieves, you know, and they hit the headlines. But the majority of people that end up in prison are people who are dependent on drugs or they've made a mistake in their life and that's driven their, their criminality and they're in this spiral. And like me, and it comes from that place of experience, like me, when I was released from prison, having fought all those years to get out, I met an individual who gave me an opportunity. You know, that individual didn't have to give me an opportunity, but that individual took it upon themselves, that one individual took it upon himself to give me an opportunity, and that opportunity changed my life. And it's what led to me being right here, right now, talking to you about foundation, about inside the world's toughest prisons, and the career that I've had as a journalist. And that's all I'm asking for people, is to give somebody an opportunity. And if that means making a small donation, if that means making a huge donation, if that means lending your your time and your expertise to the foundation, you know, because we need people in all areas and, and we've got some terrific people wanting to help and, you know, more people than we can we can use. But it's about, you know, somebody giving you the opportunity. And I bang on about that all the time. If you are the person who can give somebody an opportunity, and it doesn't mean you practically having to be there, 
but knowing that you've done it can make a huge difference to somebody's life. And on that note, Jamie, thank you so much for, you know, crashing in on our trip to Amsterdam. Thank you for sharing with the audience and asking me questions about what the foundation is. And as you say, if people want to find out more about what the foundation is about, more about me, more about the work that we're doing in prisons, they can go to the RaphaelRoeFoundation.org website. They can go to the raphael rowcom website to find out more about who we are and what we're trying to do. They can go to the Netflix series and watch the latest one that's coming out or previous episodes just to give them an insight as to why we are doing what we're doing. Because what they will discover, as many people have told me, is that the individuals that they believe needed to be locked up and the key to be thrown away actually need to be unlocked and let out and given an opportunity or educated or skill trained, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, Jamie, for, for taking up some time to have a chat with me. Hey, Raphael, thank you. And uh, good luck with the, uh, with the re release of the, uh, the latest series and uh, huge admiration and respect for you, as I've, I've, as I've said many times. But it's, uh, it's incredible that you, the, the vision that you've got, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to more success in the future with you. Thank you for watching or listening to the Second Chance podcast, where we share stories of redemption, hope, resilience, and second chances. Who deserves a second chance? Who has the right to give someone a second chance? And is a second chance even deserved? That's what Second Chance is all about. So subscribe if you want to be kept up to date with new episodes.